In this video, we're going to go through one of what I think is one of the cornerstones of organic chemistry, and this is understanding dipoles and partial charges. Why is this important? Well, it's important because we need to understand where the electrons are and where the electrons aren't. Because in chemistry, we'll learn that your reactions are really like transactions of electrons between atoms. And understanding where those electrons are and where they aren't is a lot like an economist not knowing where you know currency is or is not. You have to understand where things are before you can understand how it moves around. So that is what we're going to do. And we're going to draw out some very simple molecules here. And, and they're not going to be very complicated. We're just going to keep it fairly simple here. And what the goal of this video is so that we can I can teach you how to look at a simple molecule and understand, like I said, where are the electrons and where are they not? So we can figure out how they might react. Because one of the key rules in chemistry and specifically um, not just not just chemistry itself, but also organic chemistry, and that is that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So if you understand that concept, it'll actually take you a far, pretty far way in organic chemistry towards understanding why certain reactions happen and certain reactions don't. So what I've drawn out here is just drawn out six fairly simple molecules. And the next step um, before getting into uh, dipoles and partial charges is just, if you remember, that even though we may draw out these, these structures like this, we have these implicit or hidden lone pairs on some of these atoms. It might help to draw these out just so we understand what's there and what isn't. Because oftentimes we won't draw these in because it takes time to draw out these little, these little lone pairs. So we'll often just skip over drawing them. But it's just because you'll, you skip over drawing them doesn't mean they're not there. OK, so here's the key take home message from from this video what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these bonds okay and we're going to use a concept called electronegativity and if you haven't heard of electronegativity before uh, you should know because it's very important it's think of it kind of like if you want to think of it in a human term think of it like greed for electrons think of it like greed for electrons and what this means is that a more electronegative element is going to pull electrons towards itself. So they pull, uh, pull, pulls electrons towards itself. And that is what a highly electronegative element will do. It will pull electrons towards itself. So it's, it, is, it has a tendency to attract electrons. So what we're going to do is go through each of these bonds and decide uh, what end of the bond is going to be a little bit more electron rich and which end is going to be more electron poor. And like I said, it comes down to this concept called electronegativity. And we can compare the electronegativity of different elements quite easily because uh, we have measured electronegativity tables for all the elements in the periodic table with a few exceptions. So what we're going to do is going to go through each of these bonds. Let's start with HCl. We ask ourselves HCl. So is this pair of electrons between hydrogen and chlorine that's shown by this bond here, is this equally shared? And we should know the answer is no. The answer is no because, well, chlorine, as it turns out, has an electronegativity of 3.16, okay, only roughly 3.2, and hydrogen's about 2.2, right? So 3.16 and 2.2, which means that our chlorine is going to be pulling a little bit more than its fair share of this pair of electrons from the hydrogen. And because electrons are negatively charged, they're, it's going to have a partial negative charge. And the hydrogen's going to have a partial positive charge. Okay, So delta, that delta sign means partial. So partial negative, partial positive. And for water, if we look at the electronegativity of water, it's 3.4, hydrogen's 2.2. So again, it's going to be delta minus, delta plus, delta plus. Okay, And for this molecule here, which is what we call a ketone, uh, again, we've got an oxygen. We're going to look for the most most electronegative element. So we're actually not going to worry so much about the hydrogen and the carbon here. We're going to pick out the most electronegative element because the most, the biggest dipole is the one we're going to care about the most. So we've got oxygen we know is 3.4, carbon's 2.5. So that means that oxygen is going to be pulling these electrons towards it from the carbon, so delta minus, delta plus. And CH3, CH2, BR. Where does BR stand? Well, BR is 
in the table of the halogens, in the column of the halogens. So Br is an electronegativity of 2.96, carbon's 2.55. So it's, it's got a higher electronegativity, delta minus. And this carbon, maybe we should draw this out to make it a little bit more clear. We have carbon, draw it a little bigger, carbon attached to a hydrogen and another hydrogen. This carbon will be delta plus. And again, we can kind of ignore the other carbon and hydrogens here. It's not as important because we really care mostly about the biggest dipole. Now this next example is interesting. We've got a carbon attached to a magnesium attached to a chlorine. So how do we deal with that? Well, carbon is 2.5. Where's magnesium? Well, it's over here in the alkaline earth metals. It's actually 1.3, an electronegativity of 1.3. So it is actually, in this case, our carbon is more electronegative than the magnesium. So carbon's got delta minus, magnesium's got delta plus. Okay, and then we've got chlorine, which we said earlier was 3.16. So chlorine is gonna be also delta minus. Now, uh, oh, and nitrogen. So nitrogen is 3.0, uh, 3.0, and hydrogen is 2.2, carbon's 2.5. So delta minus, your biggest dipoles are going to be here, but these are all going to be partial to some extent. Okay, so just understanding where the partial charges are is a first step towards understanding how a molecule might react. And we're not going to talk about specific reactions here. We're just going to talk about attractive forces. You said knowing that that opposite charges attract and like charges repel, we can think about potential reactions, potential situations which might involve reactions. So start with this HCl. Let's, let's just think about this H plus. What might this H plus be re react or be attracted to in this molecule of water? What might this H plus be attracted to in this molecule of water? Well, would it be attracted to another H plus? Well, that would be like charges, right? That hydrogen should not be attracted to that hydrogen. Knowing that opposite charges attract, we should know that it's this hydrogen which is going to have an attractive influence between, between there's going to be an attractive influence between this hydrogen and this oxygen. Okay. And you know, likewise, we can go and look at this molecule here, this ketone, between carbon and oxygen, what end has the delta plus, what end has the delta minus? Well, this would be more attracted to, again, would be attracted to the oxygen, right? This would be an attractive interaction. And, you know, we could even draw it between the bromine here as an attractive interaction. And between this hydrogen, this carbon here. The delta, the delta minus carbon, or one might think the chlorine. Now, how do you decide between carbon and chlorine? That comes down to a topic called nucleophilicity. We talk about that, and so we there's actually a series of videos where I talk about nucleophilicity. Um, it turns out carbon's a better nucleophile than, than chlorine is. Um, but these are we're not talking, not talking about specific reactions; we're just talking about attractive interactions. And again, you know, the H plus might be attracted to this delta minus on the nitrogen. Okay, so this tells us some, we can sort of map out some of the attractive interactions between this H plus and Cl. Now, like I said earlier, the H plus is not gonna be attracted to the positive charge on the carbon. There's gonna be no potential reaction between H plus and the, and the carbon. And there's gonna be no potential reaction between the H plus and the other H plus, or between this carbon, or between the magnesium or between the hydrogen. So understanding the partial charges on this HCl helps us to understand uh, what potential reactions might happen and what reactions might not happen. And in fact, a lot of the things which I've drawn out here as dotted lines turn out, you know, when we talk about reactions later, turn out to be real reactions. Like HCl does react with H2O in exactly this method. Uh, HCl does react with this ketone in exactly this way, uh, oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, HCl does react with uh, ethyl magnesium bromide in exactly this way. And with NH2, the only one doesn't actually react with very well is ethyl bromide here. Okay, maybe we'll look at a slightly different example. Um, so if we take water, let's look at water. So we've got water where we've got, we've got H plus and we've got our OH minus. 
uh, so our O, sorry, just our O with a partial negative. This oxygen, which is partially negative, okay, it's going to be, maybe we'll use a slightly different color here. It's going to have, if we look at this ketone, it's going to be attracted to this partially positive carbon. It's not going to be attracted to the partial negative oxygen, right? On the same lines, if we look at this magnesium, this uh, ethyl magnesium chloride, what part of ethyl magnesium chloride is the oxygen going to be attracted to? Well, it would be attracted to the magnesium, right? Because it's plus, and the oxygen's minus. If the oxygen's minus, you know, it would be attracted to the H of the NH2Cl, uh, NH2CH3, sorry, or to the carbon of the CH3CH2Br or you know the O we already sort of did that interaction so between the the, the H plus of uh, the Delta plus of HCl so again understanding where the electrons are and where they're not we can, we can start to map out these interactions between charges that you know opposite charges are going to be attractive interactions and like charges are going to not be attractive interactions and although we've really only done like five or six different examples here we can really apply this for a large number of examples. And if you understand electronegativity, if you understand electronegativity and you can identify bonds between atoms with different electronegativity, you can identify dipoles, which are, dipoles are areas where there's a part, there's a um, difference in charges. So opposite charges, which are um, adjacent to each other. So HCl, for example, has a slight dipole this hydrogen is partially positive and this chlorine is partially negative. Uh, so understanding this principle, you'll be able to understand the basics of how molecules can react because it all comes down to, again, opposite charges attract and like charges repel.